how far away from the initial story idea did this movie end up being? It is an interesting question. We, uh, we started out making a film which was going to be about wine. Uh, it was going to be shot on Handy Cam. Uh, it was going to be about the Bordelais and Ontelbe and the fact that prices have been going through the roof. Uh, and like any documentary, you never quite know what, which story you're telling until you actually get onto the ground. And this story, as you saw in the film, the story started to unfold as we were filming it. You know, the story was about wine, and then it became about business, and then it became about money, and finally it became about China, and then really what it was about was the shift in economic power from the West to the East. So, as you saw on script, that's sort of how the film unfolded as we were filming it. Um, I also want to know, did you come across, when you were filming in France, more of a feeling of people being outraged about the fact that the market was um, being essentially bought up by China, or were people quite open to it? Yes, a little bit of both is the answer. Um, uh, I mean, there was outrage that, uh, the outrage really was that the Chinese were moving into Bordeaux and buying up some of the chateaus. That's sort of where the outrage was, and I think it's born out of prejudice. Um, but the, 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 the Bordelais were only too happy to see the, the Chinese come in and buy up everything they make. I mean, there was no problem there. They just didn't want them in Bordeaux, necessarily. Um, so those kind of prejudices we, we explored a little bit. Um, and, and, and the more we heard about the Chinese and their, you know, their, their attitudes towards wine, and they really didn't have a palate, and, uh, and, and that they had Coca-Cola to their red wine, uh, and uh, that they really didn't know what they were doing. China, of course, spent um, at least five or six times in China going all through the place. And what we discovered there was that the Chinese actually have um, developing a palate very quickly for wine. And whereas the, uh, the, the concept of adding Coca-Cola to their red wine was true maybe 20 years ago, that their palate was developing really quickly now. Um, so the, the, it was a sort of a love-hate relationship that the Bordelais had with the Chinese. But certainly the, the, in Bordeaux at the time we were there, they felt very much that the road was painted with gold all the way to China and that they were going to really clean up. And, uh, and I think they really underestimated what was happening uh, with, uh, with the market. They turned their backs on their traditional customers. So America, they put it off in the UK, buyers, they blew away because they, they, they put all their eggs in one basket and that basket was China. And within 12 months of time, that market had more or less collapsed down 60% on, uh, on the previous year. And uh, so a story that, that started with you know, quite a bit of arrogance and, and, and greed, and it was generally acknowledged that even the people we interviewed in Bordeaux were saying, yes, we're very greedy. Uh, and uh, it backfired on them. And so there ended up being some humility at the end of it. And, and that was the this sort of relatively, well, we thought it was quite an extraordinary sight that we were doing this journey for all of us. Um, speaking of which, so it's a year on now? Well, we, we filmed for uh, around 14 months, thereabouts, and then we, we were in the, in the cutting room for about 9 months, 19 months. Oh, now, okay, right, yes. Um, the, uh, well, you saw what happened at the end of that, that year, the on the, the prices crashed by something like 50%, and the volume of sales was down 60%, uh, 60 and this last on which happened just um, sort of May, a couple of months ago, uh, prices were down again another 30%. So having dropped at least 50%, another 30 on top of that, they're down 80% from those all-time highs. Albeit that it was off a very high um, uh, starting point. So they're about where they probably should have been three or four years ago before this gigantic escalation started. Um, does anyone have a question? Yes, please. Um, you've mentioned that you Um, is this film being shown in France, and if so, what was the reception? Any thoughts, criticisms as to what Ben thought about the film? Uh, yes, yes, the answer to your question is uh, yes, it's been shown in Bordeaux. That was the first public screening of the film. We took it back to Bordeaux uh, with our investors, um, and we showed it for all of the winemakers in Bordeaux, and as you can probably um, understand, it was a very tense evening for us. Um, <laughs> 
before we show the film. And, um, and happily, uh, and you know, and this, this is really gives you a good understanding of, of, the, of the border culture. Um, they loved the film, even though we were, you know, we were quite critical of the industry there. We were, you know, we were telling a particular kind of story, and they had absolutely no control over that story. Uh, they loved what we did, uh, and um, you know, we had comments like it, it took a bunch of Aussies to make the first great film about Bordeaux. Um, so that was great, you know, and that tells you something about the borderland itself. You know, they are. Um, they're a very sophisticated community, and, and they do really love the fact that people come in and have independent, an independent voice. Um, yeah, so that was, it was a great night, wasn't it? It was, and, and particularly since there, there had been another documentary, Mondo Vino, which some of you might know. Mondo Vino had been through, uh, you know, many years before, but uh, a lot of the Baudelaire felt that they had been ridiculed by that film, and so it was really quite difficult to get to some of the people that you saw there on the screen. And while Andrew Kayard um, um, is very well known, he has a fantastic reputation in Bordeaux, and he opened the, the gates to a lot of those um, spectacular shadows for us. There were some that just simply wouldn't talk to us. And when we asked him to do the research, it was because of his film on the Vino. Um, and uh, it, by the time we'd been there two or three times, the word had got around that the film really was not a Mondovino style of film. Uh, and uh, so then we began to get to people like uh, Chef uh, Latour, uh, Frederick Angeret, who was uh, the one that says we really need to remain an open society. Uh, some Chinese should come and buy a place here and see how difficult it is. Um, it took us a long time to get to him, uh, really difficult. But, but as soon as we started getting all of those Bordeaux shadow owners on the side, then some other doors started opening. So the, the journey to China then became quite interesting because they were introducing us to some of the people that you saw. And then some of the Chinese people that heard that we were making approaching and saying, you really should meet this gentleman who has the biggest sex toy factory in the world. He <laughs> <laughs> <You> said, yes. <laughs> um, I might just quickly go back to the, uh, the feelings of the people in Bordeaux. That, um, I suppose if, if they were happy for all of their products to be getting bought up, I mean, they're making a lot of money out of it. But um, I wanted to ask, you're a winemaker yourself. Um, how did they, how do you feel about um, wine being used as, or people buying up all of what is the best wine in the world to be put into cellars that will possibly never be drunk? Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, David coined the phrase when wine becomes too expensive to drink, uh, too valuable to drink, which I think is uh, a great expression. And we had heard that there were these brokers in, in London who had set themselves up, had been bankers in the previous incarnation, but had decided that they were trading Bordeaux wines because we saw the price, of the, the price chart and there was easy money to be made. So they had clients that were spending millions of dollars buying these wines and storing them and would never look at as he said, never see the bottle. But we didn't find that in China in any way. No, it was the Westerners that were doing that. And so in many respects, the Chinese, we felt, were sort of you know, honoring the, the passion and the art of the vineyard. Uh, to a much greater degree, they, they held the Bordelais uh, and the winemakers, particularly the winemakers of these fabulous wines, in very high regard, had very, uh, very healthy respect for them, and really expressed themselves uh, as if the winemakers were artists, and as an artist would be a sculptor or a painter, and that they were very honored to be able to have these bottles and to open them. And they would open bottles that were, you know, $2,000, $10,000, $20,000, and really, you know, they would, they would pull the cork and drink them. Whereas the Westerners would say $20,000, are you kidding? That's an investment, I'll stick it away and sell it again in a few years' time. I just have one thing. Um, you know, you do get, there's a lot of cultural stereotyping that goes on, you know, and we came across it all the time. You know, the fact that these, you know, the Chinese had all the money, but they didn't have any taste, they didn't know what they were drinking, etc. etc. Um, and this, the journey of this film is a journey of sort of discover, or perhaps to break down that sort of cultural stereotyping. Um, and, you know, these, you know, at the moment, it's the Chinese who have the power and money. And it's, that's fascinating because we don't understand, we in the West don't fully understand that culture. So this journey for us was a way of beginning to understand the motivations uh, of these people. Uh, and so that was a good thing in itself for us as filmmakers. But as you start to delve into it, you realise, for example, there are always, there's always been pockets of wealth. There's always been pockets of wealth in, in, around the world 
20 years ago, it could have been Silicon Valley. You, know, you have the billionaires of, of America, and they were the ones that were buying Chateau Margaux and Chateau Lafitte, and they were paying world record prices. So they were paying 100,000 US dollars for a single bottle, um, you know, a 100 year old bottle. Um, but what they were doing with it was they would, they would fly over and they would pick up the bottle, they would take it back to their private cellar, and they'd build a little plinth and have a couple of lights and a little park. You know, and they would invite their friends around like they were coming to a museum. So you know, this this is a valuable this is a valuable bottle of wine. It's like hundred years old, and, and here it is. You know, and that's the way they would deal with it. The Chinese are now the ones that are buying these wines, and they're paying at least twice, probably almost three times as much for a single bottle of wine. You know, a hundred year old bottle of wine. What are they doing with it? They're taking it back to Beijing or Shanghai. They're inviting their friends around for a meal. They're opening the wine and they're serving. It. Because, because China is a gift-giving culture. And it's an interesting way just to see the difference between you know, one set of you know, uh, uh, rich people and another set of rich people and see the way they sort of react to the same thing. Anyone else have a question? Um, I'd love to ask that um, what are the Australian wines perceived to be China? And we see there are a lot of wineries and vineyards are rushing into China at the moment trying to sell Australian wines over there. <coughs> What advice can you give them? Um, yeah, I think most Australian wine producers are, are looking at China as, as, uh, as the next really big market. And there's quite a few Australian winemakers, of course, that are already in China. Um, I mean, I think that there's a, a cautionary tale to be told a little bit from the, the film you saw tonight. Uh, and that is, that, you know, you're never quite sure of the way things work in China. And the safest way to get involved there is certainly to find a Chinese partner who you trust and you can understand. Because culturally, there, you know, there are huge gaps. Um, they're not sort of, um, like the Americans and the, and the Brits, where we have sort of a long uh, history of language uh, similarities and things. So I, I think there's, uh, you, you've got to be a little bit careful. But, but certainly, the uh, opportunities in China are gigantic. We're already, Australia is, the, is already the second largest exporter of wine into China after France. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, I myself, you know, with our tiny little vineyard on the Mornington Peninsula, um, sold two pounds of wine two weeks ago to Shanghai, uh, and I never expected that to happen, but uh, I was you know, pleasantly surprised. Uh, the opportunities there are fantastic, uh, and, and, and the Australian winemakers, wine producers, are very highly regarded by the Chinese. Um, of course, this whole question of fakes uh, enters uh, for the Australian winemakers as, as much as it applies to the layer. Uh, Jacob's Creek, of course, has been counterfeited up in China for a long time. Grange, of course, has been counterfeited a lot. Um, but there are measures that, um, that, uh, uh, that producers are now utilizing to try and counter the effects of a lot of the, uh, the, the, the counterfeits. And the counterfeits range from very cheap kind of knockoffs where the label is you know, badly spelled and there are two Fs and two Ts and the feet. Uh, the chateau itself is the wrong chateau, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and in those markets, sometimes can be found uh, industrial alcohol, so not a single uh, drop of grape juice. Industrial alcohol, a little bit of colouring, a little bit of flavouring. Um, so incredibly dangerous to actually drink. But they can also be incredibly sophisticated as well at the other end of the scale. So you will find people who will buy empty bottles for 500 US dollars, as you saw on the screen. And they fill those bottles up, not with cheap cheap alcohol, but often they will put a Lafitte, a genuine Lafitte, into that bottle, but it will be a Lafitte of much lesser value because the vintage dictates the value. So if, if it's a bottle that you've, that you've managed to put your hands on, it's 1982, which is one of the greatest all-time vintages in Bordeaux, you know you can sell that bottle for probably six or seven thousand US dollars. So you fill it with a, a Lafitte that might be worth a thousand dollars, the bottle costs you five hundred dollars as a big problem. So um, yeah, I mean there's all sorts of pitfalls, but the opportunities are also spectacular. I'll just add one thing. It's estimated in China at the moment that at least 90% of the Lafitte that's sold in China is counterfeit. And some people say up to 99%. Anyone else? Um, yeah, my question was about the parallel um, between the Australian wine industry and how it's developed. Because really, I think it, um, it's not very different from the way China, the Chinese wine industry is developing at the moment. It just happened earlier. 
And I wonder whether that came up in Bordeaux, whether they, how they perceive the development of the Australian wine industry. That's an interesting question. I will hand over to Warwick, who's the expert in this area. But uh, what I would say is that what we came across all the time is that people would ask us, you know, have you tasted the wine from China? They must be awful. Um, and it's pretty well what people were saying about Australian wines 25, 30 years ago, and Californian wines, and wines from Chile, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just the fact that it is, it's absolutely is that. It's a, it's a brand new wine culture. And yes, there's some pretty ordinary wines, but we also tasted some very, very good wines. The, the wine that won the Decan Wine Award uh, in Hilan Fushu, uh, which um, it took everybody by surprise. Stephen Spurrier, who's one of the most famous wine judges in the world, who was on screen there saying, yes, it was a surprise, but it was tasted you know, three or four times, completely blind, and it won a trophy. Um, there were rumors that began circulating immediately that this wine, uh, that, that won this, this very, very prestigious award, couldn't possibly have been Chinese wine, that it must have been a Bordeaux wine, Smuggled by the barrels <laughs> and then it's rebagged and rebottled it as a French wine, as a Chinese wine, and brought back to the Canada Wine Awards in order to win. Um, so it's sort of this odd, this odd notion of a reverse fake somehow. Uh, but but we, we've been to the vineyard, we know that the consultant wine maker and the owner of the place, and we tasted the wines from the barrel. There's no question that it was a genuine Chinese wine. So they're catching up you know, fairly quickly. They, they've got some wonderful areas. Ning Xia, which you, you saw in the, in the film, which is a godforsaken stony desolate plain where Genghis Khan you know, met his last hours, um, is now just thousands and thousands of acres of vineyards going in. Um, as, as far as the eye can see, the, the back couple will stick the, you know, the little dig into the ground and drive that way for three miles. And then they'll plant you know, 10,000 vines in a row. And they irrigate it with, uh, with water from the Yellow River, which snakes all the way through China, but they dig big canals from the Yellow River, and then from the canals they run gigantic hoses, almost like fire hoses, into the, the top of the trench, and all of these uh, all of these trenches have a slight uh, gradient to them, and slowly the water trickles all the way down a mile or two miles down the way. So it's, it's very tricky to, to do what they're doing, and with temperatures that drop to minus 25, the survival of, of some of these vines, particularly as the vines mature, is really in question. Because you, you, you might be able to bend a young vine into a trench and cover it with dirt, but you certainly can't do that to a vine that's 40 years old. So we're not quite sure what's going to happen with uh, sort of longevity of the, the vines. But they're making good wines and they're and, and beginning to make good wines, and they will continue to make some, some very good wines and with water. I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah, I Given what you said at the start of the Q&A and the rich world of winemaking, um, will there be another um, you know, wine documentary in the future or are you both moving on to other projects? Um, I'm sure, we've got, sure there will be more wine documentaries. Uh, for us, we come from the world of picture filmmaking. Um, and this was sort of a one-off um, story that came up and, and, uh, and we, you know, we both thought this, this could be really interesting. We, we really work for the big screen, that's what we like to do, and um, I've got a feature film that we're shooting uh, in February of next year, um, in Outback, Queensland, uh, and Warwick and I are working on some more feature films. But that's not to say that we won't do another a documentary, and it may very well be about wine. We had a fantastic experience. This, this for us, was a great experience, um, and I'll let Warwick tell you what he thought as well. Um, but for us, you know, as... Um, as digital makers, you know, we, we wanted to make this for the big screen. Uh, we decided to shoot it on the Aria Alexa, which is a fantastic digital camera, which had only just come out at the time. We wanted to use cranes, and we wanted to use tracks, and we wanted to use helicopter shots, as you saw. Uh, and we did all of that, uh, but instead of having 150 on the crew, we had five. There was two of us, and there were three more. So there were five of us who did the whole thing. And it was great fun, you know, and we'd love to do it again. Uh, whether we do another wine one, uh, you know, we've already been approached several times about uh, doing something about Burgundy and, and other places. Uh, I'm not too sure yet. Warren? Yeah, I think this is the first documentary that, that I've heard. Uh, the second, I think, that David has made, but we generally are feature filmmakers. So uh, while we've had a number of approaches, and David's alluded to that, we had somebody approach us 
there was no bid in the world of Burgundy, who was very jealous that we'd spent the last two years in Bordeaux. What about Burgundy in India? I don't think that's on the card. I think the next thing for David and me is a, is a, is a feature film, uh, active feature film, and then, and then possibly a return to documentary uh, a little bit later on. Okay, so the last question is, what was the most expensive bottle of wine that someone popped for you? <laughs> You'll probably answer this, but well, I think it was, uh, we were in um, Chateau de Cam. Would that be the right? That, probably that one, right? We were in Chateau de Cam, which is that beautiful chateau that has a sort of a, look like a fairy tale castle, you know, when, when, when you want to go to Disneyland, it's that way. <laughs> um, it's just, it's just, it was just a beautiful place, and Chateau de Cam make a, make a Saturn. A beautiful, sweet wine. Well, when you taste it, it actually doesn't feel like sugar. It feels extraordinary. Uh, when we were, uh, we were interviewing Pierre Letton, who's the vineyard there, the, the winemaker. And, uh, and as you probably picked up tonight, um, there's one of us here who's a wine expert, and one of us who's not. Uh, I'm more of a drinker. Um, uh, and uh, we were filming Pierre Letton, and, and we said, look, monsieur, if you have a bottle, we could put it behind you, it would be really helpful. And he, and he bought out a cold bottle of 19, what it was, 2001 um, Chateau de Chem. And, and I thought, yeah, that's perfect, it's the right colour, it's the right thing, we'll put it in the window, it's fine. And the winemakers amongst us goes, <gasps> and apparently it was this extraordinary bottle of wine. So while we're doing the interview, they were all looking at this wine, bottle of wine. And at the end of the interview, uh, Monsieur Latom said, so, I suppose we should open this. <laughs> and, and he did, and he, he served it to, to, to the crew, to the five of us. And, uh, and to me, it was probably one of the, the most beautiful wines I've ever tasted. Yes, it could have been the context, it could have been the fact that we were, we were there drinking it with him. A lot of, for me, a lot of the taste of wine is about the context, it's about where you drink it, how you drink it, and who you drink it with. Yeah. Um, but for me, that was one of the great wine experiences of my life. Uh, and one that I probably will never have again because I will never, you know, it, that would put a real dent in my mortgage. That <laughs> um, but uh, so that was for me. Work. Was, which one was for you? Yeah, that was a, that was a spectacular one, and I think what was uh, was funniest about that is that Lee Baldwin, who was our Emmy award-winning cameraman, uh, who's madly packing up his camera because we were actually running late for Shadow of Feet, which is the very next interview. We were about an hour away, and we had about 40 minutes to get there. Uh, so Lee is packing up his camera really quickly, like this. Sees Peter Le Ton pour four or five glasses of this 2001 uh, Chateau de Chem. And, and, and Andrew and I and David and Rob Cohen were sitting on this thing. And, what a spirit, and Lee was packing up his camera and oh my god, I'm going to miss this. You know, so we get right down, and the time has come, he's packed all his gear. I say, it's so Lee, we've got to get going right now. He just grabs the glass like this and just goes, <laughs> <laughs> told the chap at the cam was uh, here at the time, I said to him, what is the oldest bottle of wine that you have here? And sweet wines do last an awfully long time. And uh, he said, well, we've got a number of a number of uh, bottles of wine actually downstairs that um, we were meant to deliver to uh, Thomas Jefferson. We haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> and he, with that, he pulls out a letter from Thomas Jefferson to um, to the owner, uh, his name is Le Salus, um, this is 200. And he pulls the letter out and says, you know, dear Monsieur Le you know, um, uh, I love your wines very much and would like to buy some. And I have convinced my friend uh, General Washington to buy some too. Um, he would like uh, two dozen cases. I can only, afford, I can only unfortunately, uh, afford two cases. Uh, and so there was some like six bottles or something left of this order that hadn't yet been delivered to Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. The best wine I had, I think, was a 1949 Chateau Petrus during the course of that. Yeah, it's a beautiful and really revelatory film to be very effective way. So thank you very much.